light of Christ, shine on our path. Chase away all darkness and lead us to the heart of God. Welcome, neighbor. Glad you are here. It is a good day. A good day. Every day we grow closer to spring and warmth. It is a good day. It is a good day to be renewed in the hope that comes with this time of year. And I pray that you're able to see those signs of hope that, uh, that are bursting forth from the ground and on the shrubs around us. It is a good day also to be together in worship. I am glad we can be together. And as we gather in, in God's spirit, it is my prayer that we will experience through this technology, the very presence of God, that we will know God's grace, that we will know God's power, we will know God's love, we will know God's peace. So I invite you to, to uh, get your bottle of water or, or your favorite hot beverage for whatever time of day you might be uh, worshiping with us. I invite us to quiet our minds to focus, to focus our thoughts on God's presence and open ourselves to, to the ways God chooses to speak to us in our scripture, in our prayers, in our hymns, in our time together. So now, now is the time to worship. Let's do it. My opening conversation as we, as we gather is, uh, I want you to check out this plate of brownies. Mmm. Now I show you this picture because, well, I was afraid that if Janet or I made homemade brownies for illustrative purposes for our worship service, well, I'm not so sure I could have resisted the temptation to sample them at some point in the course of our worship gathering. So I just, I found this picture and, and they looked absolutely delicious. Now, now why? Why am I drawing your attention to brownies? Well, I want to point out that there are some good things in life, some nice things in life that are very expensive, that many people seek after. Very expensive cars and homes and boats and jewelry and I, I'm sure you can name other items that are just, mmm, they, they're just something that sometimes we just feel we have to have. But I also want to juxtapose those very expensive things with some things that are, some good things that are just not so expensive. In fact, they might be free. I can think of some. Um, smiling at someone doesn't cost us much. Hugging someone, those days will come back. I, 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 boy, I hope they do. Um, walking with someone who is lonely, a family member, a neighbor. Those are just a few that I've named. But also, it is an expression of, of, that brings us joy to, to make homemade brownies cookies or casseroles. These are inexpensive ways to share good things with others and to experience the joy of giving to others. Now I want us to, to ponder that there are some inexpensive ways that are actually better, better than the expensive things I listed at the beginning. And these, these brownies that I've 
shown here, for example, are better than, I believe anyway, than store-bought bought brownies. No matter how much you might pay for them in the fanciest, danciest uh, uh, um, bakeries, I believe the homemade brownies are the best, in my opinion. So we're going to hear in a moment the scripture from the Old Testament in which God says, you that have no money, come, come anyway, buy and eat. And then Isaiah continues, listen carefully to me, eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Hmm. Now, he didn't exactly say brownies, but that would be my choice to come to a, to come to a, a, a smorgasbord and find. I propose God gives us many good things that require absolutely no money at all. Love, forgiveness, strength, power, peace, guidance. God gives these good gifts. And furthermore, I propose that these gifts from God have lasting power all the way to and through eternity. And so God wants us to value these good, inexpensive gifts instead of concentrating all of our time and our energies and our desires and on, on expensive things like cars and boats and homes and jewelry and, and so forth. There is nothing, nothing more valuable than the free gifts of God. And so today, we're going to explore another crossroad experience through this season of Lent. And this crossroad is brought about as a result of a drought of sorts. The people of God, Israel, as you will hear in a moment, are, well, they're in exile. They were taken from the land God gave them by enemy powers because they, well, the general way to put it is they have done what is evil in the eyes of God. But God's people valued something other than God. The God who gave them freedom from the Egyptians, the freedom, the God who led them through the wilderness, the God who led them to the promised land and then into the promised land. Yeah, this God is the one their eyes have strayed, their hearts have strayed. They forgot. They forgot all God did for them. Listen. Listen, though, to this announcement of a servant of God by the name of Isaiah. An announcement Isaiah extended to the exiled people, the Israelites. I hope you will see that God is not done giving. To God's people then and now. Hear the word of God. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and, your, and you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant my steadfast, sure love for David. See? 
I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord well, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. May God bless the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. So the scripture spoke of thirst and coming to God. God being the source of that which will quench our thirst and satisfy our hungers. So it seemed appropriate that we would enjoy one of the long-standing hymns of the United Methodist Church and Christianity. Come thou fount of every blessing. So listen or sing along. But may we be reminded of the source of all goodness and all blessing. another and certainly to connect with God. I invite us into this, as we continue this, this worship experience, into the prayer concerns. Some of you have them um, in the sermon notes that um, are available online, and I'd like to, uh, to share these, to read these uh, for those who may not have those notes and may be listening via telephone. These concerns I bring before you, the people of God. Walter and Dorothy Starcher, Josh Ewing, George Rogers, Pat Loomis, Larry and Susan Jarvis, Sebastian Kunkler, Carolyn Cernick, Rachel Evans. We pray for Harold Simmons, 
Millie Haddix, Lenora Cotting, continues her journey of recovery. We pray for Jeff Parker, for his comfort. We pray for Val Ewing, Bernie Arnold, Anthony. We pray for Ray, these are the concerns that I bring before you. I wish also to share with you joys. Joy for Joe. Joe has returned to work this week after a very serious bout with COVID-19. He was in intensive care for several days. He was on a ventilator during that time. He's been off work since just before Christmas, fighting this, this, uh, this virus. So we rejoice with Joe and his family as he uh, makes this tremendous progress. We rejoice with the vaccines that are being approved and the administration of these vaccines at greater numbers. We rejoice for the return of in-person worship in the very, uh, a very few weeks uh, ahead of us. We, Palm Sunday, we will be in the sanctuary and streaming online, and we will continue to be online. And so we're grateful for the technology. We're grateful for those who volunteer their time um, to make sure that this technology uh, finds its way to you who are listening. These are concerns. There are joys uh, around our world. If we look for them hard enough, God is still moving in our midst. And so we pray that God will rest a healing hand upon those we have named this morning and upon those you are aware of in your life. I invite us to pause in the spirit of prayer. O loving God, as we gather in this time of worship, let there be a time for healing for those we have named, a time for comfort, for those who grieve, a time of calm for those who are anxious, a time for kindness that heals so many hurts, a time for peacemaking that ends the need for warfare, a time for sharing that brings food to the hungry, a time for justice that brings hope to our world, a time for giving that teaches us how to be generous, a time to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My thoughts along the way as we continue in this Lenten sermon series focusing on crossroads, crossroad moments in our life. 
draws upon those moments in life when we just, well, we experience a drought of sorts. It's what came to my mind as I read the scripture. And in the opening conversation, I referred to God's people, the Israelites, experiencing a drought. But it's a different type of drought than, than may first come to mind. My sense is that, that what comes to mind when you hear the word drought is an extended an extended period of, of dry weather when an area gets less than its normal amount of, of rain over a course of months, and in some instances over a course of years, crops and other plants, we know that they need water to grow, and animals need water, humans need water, to be recreated, to sustain life. A drought in which there is limited water is a natural event. Although drought most, may be most frequently thought of as a weather phenomenon, I, <laughs> I s propose and, and share that I've experienced a drought in my life. Yes, I am a Cleveland sports fan. And I have experienced droughts in my lifetime. Some of you are older than I am and you've experienced longer droughts than I have. This past football season saw a drought ended for the Browns as they earned the right to play in the first playoff game in, uh, well, a very long time. Drought. Mm -hmm. It's also been used to describe a, a period of time when a person has not been on a date or has not been in a long-term relationship. Sometimes we talk about relational droughts. If you can think of other uses of the term drought, besides the one where it's a shortage of water and you know the crops die and so on and so forth, well, if you can, if you can think of something else, then share with me, Pastor, at GrangerUMC.org, I, um, I, would, I would like to expand my thinking of what it means to be in a drought. And you might be able to be a part of that uh, expansion, if you will, that, that teaching. My throat is a little parched, so excuse me just a moment. Droughts have always been with us course of history. You can read about these, the typical drought, or lack of water, lack of rain throughout history. Droughts, I'm going to suggest because of climate types of uh, adjustments that are happening, droughts will always be with us. I propose that droughts are a sort of um, crossroad experience, whether weather-related or spiritually related that we would all do well to prepare for. I mentioned it. The people of Israel knew about droughts. They lived in a land where water was a, a precious commodity. And so Isaiah uses this image of, coming, of being thirsty, of being a shortage of water. Isaiah the prophet spoke to a, re a rather receptive audience, if you will, when he wrote, Come, come, all though you who thirst are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Then he goes on, he says, Why spend money on what is not bread and, your, and you labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and 
you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear to me, come and listen, that you may live. Isaiah is speaking to Israel, the people of God, on behalf of God. That's what prophets do. He's not writing about physical thirst necessarily. He's writing in this instance about spiritual thirst. And he gives the people some clues why their lives are spiritually parched. He gives the people some clues why they are in the situation that they are in. It was not a natural occurrence. It was their choice. He explains. Spiritual thirst didn't end in Isaiah's time. And the kind of thirst he's addressing, Isaiah, is still with us today. Isaiah says that the people become spiritually thirsty as a result of misplaced values. Misplaced values. <laughs> See, that is at the heart. That is at the heart of the people's problem is, is the point that Isaiah is trying to make. They, are, they have been spending their money and their time on that which will never permanently bring satisfaction to them. It will not last. And that, I will say, is the truth for people through humanity in every generation. Our eyes wander, our hearts stray, and we focus on things that are not lasting. Crisis, like a drought, gives us an opportunity, I'm suggesting, to re-examine our priorities, to, to reevaluate our values. And this has been the case for many in this particular year, in this last 12-month period. Can you believe it? In the next coming days, it will be 12 months since we just kind of shut down and masked up and stayed in, you know, uh, quarantined and learned all kinds of terms. COVID-19 has led countries and companies and churches and families to explore their values. And in several instances that I've become aware of, to reprioritize. I'd love to hear how the pandemic has led you to adjust your values, to reprioritize. Again, email me and, and share with me. I want to I hear how this has affected you with your priorities and your values. So, back to the scripture. The 55th chapter is where we read. The prophet is prodding the people of Israel to, to reconsider their behavior, to reevaluate their behavior in light of what God is doing again in their midst. Namely, God is exercising discretion and choosing to give abundantly. That they choose God's abundance rather than the adultery, the, excuse me, not the adultery, the, the, the idolatry, the idolatry, there's a difference there, the idolatry that led the to judgment and exile in the first place. Remember the, the people of God, the Israelites, did what was evil in the eyes of God. Their hearts strayed, their eyes wandered, and boom. The enemy carried them away from the promised land and took them into exile, working for them. But their labor was for others and not for themselves. And so in Isaiah's hope filled plea. He's saying that there's plenty in God's kingdom. It's free. It's free. People still make 
the same mistakes the Israelites made. We, we, our, our values, our priorities are mis, misplaced. Parents, people can also become spiritually parched, experience a drought when we betray kingdom values. The Bible's way of, of saying this is that, is that people become spiritually thirsty when they sin. They experience this spiritual separation from the source of life when they sin. A few verses deeper into the, what I read to you uh, just a moment ago. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord. And he will have mercy on them. And to our God, he will freely pardon. We may not use the word wicked, much anymore, or the word unrighteous. But that doesn't mean that people no longer do wicked and unrighteous things. We just use different words. In today's vernacular, we say things like, mistakes were made. I used poor judgment. I was confused. My comments were taken out of context. We're never at a loss for spinning our actions to sidestep our, our betrayal of, of values. It might help us during this Lenten season to acknowledge that what we are doing is what it is. It is sin. We are sinning. We are sinning against our family. Perhaps we're sinning against our neighbor, sinning against ourselves. But ultimately, when our eyes wander and, and our hearts go astray, when we betray kingdom values, we are ultimately sinning against God. Again, Isaiah, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon so people experience spiritual drought. They become thirsty spiritually because of misplaced values. And people experience drought and are spiritually thirsty because they have betrayed kingdom values. But I think there's another, there's another cause of spiritual droughts or spiritual thirst that we would do well to prepare for. People are spiritually parched because they depend on their own resources. Listen again to the words of Isaiah. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy, eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Come where? To God. That's what Isaiah is telling God's people, to come back to God. The resources of God are available to all of us. Come thou fount of every blessing, Jesus God is the fount. 
available to all of us. Regardless of who we are, regardless of what we've done, we come to the source of life. God is available, and God's resources are free. All we need to do is ask. <laughs> All of this restoration that Isaiah invites the people of God to experience is predicated on one thing that Israel seemed unable to accomplish in the days prior to their exile. And what's that one thing? They must turn to God with all their hearts. And in that turning, they repent. In that turning, they, they admit that they are not the fount of all the blessings, that God is the fount of all the blessings. And when they, when they turn and repent and admit that they do not have all the resources for everlasting life, God will pardon them and show them mercy. Mm, be, with the mercy that has no end at, un, at all. So the prophet declares, now is the time. God is at hand. The door is open. God is near and inviting you, the Israelites, to return to the land promised to Abraham, delivered once they once enjoyed it and now they don't. Now is the time to turn to God and expect restoration. Re expect an end to the drought. Expect the end to the spiritual thirst. Expect life. The returning exiles were charged to establish a way of life a way of life where the highest priority was always, always, always directed to God. God was inviting them to renew the covenant that had been in effect since the time of Abraham. And now Isaiah is saying, drought over! Woohoo! It is with the future in mind that God invites his people then and always into a new way of ordering, of ordering our lives. If we seek God's kingdom values, we will, we will dream of God's reign and God's rule on earth and in our lives. We will not dread God's reign and rule on the earth and in our lives. We will welcome. It's radically different. And be aware, it will radically alter our priorities, our values. We will no longer see money and possessions as ours, but as belonging to God and something God gives us. We will recognize that we are not really owners, rather we are stewards, we are caretakers of the blessings with which God has entrusted to us. We will not be so much be thinking about what we acquire as about what we can do for others, what we can give away. We will begin to see that we are not alone, but we are a part of a community. God's people gathered together to encourage and strengthen and give hope to one another. We will begin dreaming about how God will use our lives for 
eternal, everlasting purposes. Oh, neighbor, has life become materially rich but spiritually parched? Have you come to a crossroad experience in life and you are challenged to depend no longer on your own resources? You no longer trust your own resources. Is this an occasion to reclaim kingdom values? To turn your values around? And if so, if so, then Isaiah reminds us even today in the 21st century, there is nothing more valuable than the free gifts of God. I hope you can hear these words afresh. As your mind might have focused on, well, on the times in life when your eyes strayed or your heart wandered and you may have betrayed or misplaced kingdom values. You may have relied on your own resources. I pray, I pray, I pray you will hear this invitation spoken long ago to a people who who suffered from spiritual drought. For the words are as true today as ever. Come. Listen. Listen to me. You will live in a wasteland. You will live in, in drought conditions no more. Come, listen, live. That's my prayer. That's my prayer for the world. For you. I offer some additional reflections in the sermon notes. I offer a story that, that spoke to me in, in such a powerful way as I, as I read that story many times over. And rather than elongate um, this time of worship, this sermon, I thought, you know, if, if they want to hear it, they can read it. And, and I pray God will speak through that story. And that you might even reflect on some of the questions there. So that this message, my thoughts along the way, might, might continue beyond the time this service concludes and you turn your computer off. But in light of the invitation that Isaiah extended and the call to repent, it seemed oh so appropriate to join in a prayer of confession. The prayer is printed in the sermon notes, or you may simply you may simply draw your heart into the spirit of prayer to quiet your mind and listen as I pray. O oh, gracious God, you are ever more ready to give than we are to receive. You bless us richly with love that knows no bounds, with peace that passes all understanding. Yet, somehow we are often convinced that we, we may have greater gifts. Failing to trust in 
your goodness, we turn elsewhere, elsewhere for love, seeking solace from our reputations, our image, or even our possessions. We hope to find peace behind closed doors, protected by our sense of security. Even in our best efforts, we confess we come up short. Forgive us. O loving Savior, teach us once again to follow you. Show us how to drink deeply from God's well of abundance that we might trust your divine ways. Strengthen us to live joyfully as your disciples to live joyfully with love and peace. Amen. Well, we see in this, in this scripture before us today, again, the generosity, the love, the, the desire to forgive that is all about God. We are reminded that God loved and so God gave and we love God and so we give. Reaching out, gener being generous is a value of God's kingdom. With the recent weather, um, that has happened throughout our country, the, the, the Midwest, the uh, Southwest. Aid has come from many sources to help people with water and, and, and places to come together to give them some type of power and some type of hope. Among those Sources, our church groups and the government and so forth. And among those church groups is the United Methodist Church. In the United Methodist Church, we have an agency, a group, a ministry called United Methodist Committee on Relief, or as we United Methodists call it, UMCOR. You can go on umc.org and share a gift directly with UMCOR. But you can also give to Granger United Methodist Church. And I assure you that a portion of your gift supports the efforts to meet human needs in emergency situations. You may share your gift online by going to our website. You may share your gift by sending it directly to our church office. But thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your outreach. Thank you for your generosity to the mission and ministry of Granger United Methodist Church. So as we prepare to go forth, dear friends, go forth with the hope of new beginnings. Go forth with a trust of God's redeeming love. Go forth with courage and live in the promise of eternal life. Go forth to blossom and flourish as the good news takes root in your hearts. And until we meet again, may God's grace and God's peace watch over us and keep us until we meet again. Amen.